works? This is not my one up top. So I don't know how this one works. No, I'm good. When you click on it, I'm good. I think I think I figured this out. It looks a lot like my computer to be honest. It felt very similar. Hi. Um, let me adjust the microphone up a bit. I'm a bit tall. Hello. Um, how are y'all doing? Good. All awake still? It's been a few long days for me. Um, but I'm really glad to be here. This is my first time in the country, actually. I've never been here before. I'm really happy to be here. Um, now, I do this thing where event organizers reach out to me like four or five months in advance, right? And they ask me, what is your talk about? And the honest answer is, I don't know, right? I have no idea. So I give them an answer that sounds nice. And in this case, it was about the uh, navigating the indie maze, uh, which is a really cool talk, which I, I would love to do. But then uh, the way I, I really like giving talks is I go to a place, and then I talk to some developers, and then I ask, what should I talk about? And then they tell me, well, these are the things we're kind of struggling with. And then I write the talk like in the back of the room like right there, about an hour ago. So I just wrote this talk, and it's not the talk that's in the schedule. Um, very sorry about that. Uh, I hope this one is more useful. If not, I'll leave 10 minutes for Q&A, so you can ask whatever you want. Deal? OK, good. So I want to talk about uh, if the keyboard works. Right, it's great. Uh, no, these keyboards. Yeah, this is great. Uh, actually. Let's set the screen slightly different. This is fun. You want to duplicate the screen? Yeah, I'll just set it to extend. I'll be fine. I think. <laughs> if I break everything, I am so sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Slideshow. No. Close this guy. Wow, these computers are complicated. <laughs> and, oh, wow. Shortcut. <laughs> In case anybody wanted to learn about PowerPoint this morning, uh, here we are. This looks good. This looks really good. No. Oh, yeah, I found it. I found it. I found it. There it is. Hi. Hello. Wow. Oh, it's all from right to left. That's cool. Uh, yeah, no, I can, I can deal with this. I'm half Egyptian. I can deal with this. I know how right to left works. I just haven't seen this in a while. Okay. Hi, my name is Rami Ismail. Uh, good morning. I, uh, instead of talking about the maze, I'm going to talk about creative business, artistic entrepreneurship, and other paradoxes. Um, my name is Rami. Uh, I'm one half of the Dutch Independent Studio named Flambeer. Um, it, do, should I do the like five minute introduction of who I am and what I do? Is there anybody who wants to hear that? Yeah, yeah I see some people who want to hear that. It's good. So that's me, uh, in case like, we look alike. Um, I do business, I do marketing, I do development. I'm a programmer, uh, first and foremost. I started programming when I was really, really young. I was six years old. Uh, we had an MS DOS computer, and the only way we could play a game uh, was there was this game called Gorillas. Gorillas.bas, and it was in QBasic, and the only way to run the game was to open QBasic, look at the code, and then run it. Uh, a six-year-old me had no idea what the code meant because I didn't speak English back in the day, but I saw that if you scroll through the text, through the code, you would see the text from the main menu. So I removed all that and just entered my name. <laughs> so the next time I booted up the game, instead of the main menu, it just showed Rami. And that was awesome! So I kept making video games for all of my life. No, that's actually what happened. Um, anyway, so I'm a programmer, and then um, um, there's this other guy who's the other half of Lambert, and uh, his name is uh, Jan Willem, but nobody knows how to pronounce that, so we say JW. Uh, JW is the other half of Lambert, um, so he is our designer. And what JW does is he draws little doodles and then makes prototypes. He's really good at prototyping. Um, and then together we make games. And since we started, we've made quite a few games. We're best known for Super Crate Box, which was an independent games festival nominee back in 2010. We did Radical Fishing, which turned into Ridiculous Fishing, which was the game of the year on uh, iOS in 2013. We did Lufthrousers, which had a successful release on uh, PlayStation, uh, NPC, and a bunch of other stuff. 
We did Gun Gods, which was super well received. And uh, most recently, we did a game called Nuclear Throne. We started in 2010. Um, and it's actually a really weird story. Um, so me and JW, we're like opposites. He's like very artistic and kind of an obnoxious hipster. <laughs> and we don't like each other. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, and I am like a programmer by trade. Like I'm very focused on systems, on logic, on making things make sense. And that's who I am. So we didn't like each other. In fact, the first thing JW ever said to me was, uh, can you please shut up <laughs> in the train to school? Because um, both of us, we, we started making games very young, and then we realized we, we have to make a job out of this, so we went to a game design university, which there's universities for game design, which to us was mind-blowing. Um, so we went there, and then we met each other, and then we didn't like each other, but then the one thing we didn't like more than we didn't like each other was our school, because our school was kind of shit. Um, <laughs> So we decided that JW was really good at starting games and I was really good at wrapping up games and releasing games. So we decided if we work together, you might stand a chance. So um, we dropped out of school and uh, we started a company. And uh, yeah, that was a bad idea. Uh, so we started Flounder. This is what we ate for the first six and a half months. Uh, they are three noodles for one dollar. Uh, they come in three flavors. Uh, duck, chicken, and uh, beef. The beef and chicken are really bad. Uh, the duck is pretty good, actually. I would recommend, I would recommend the, the duck. Anyway, so we didn't have money. We dropped out of school, we didn't have money, we didn't have anything. And uh, the only thing we were ever good at was um, making games. So, what do you do if you are a school dropout without money, eating noodles, and you need to earn money, and all you know is how to make games? You make a game about fishing with machine guns. <laughs> so we did that. This was called Radical Fishing. We got uh, $10,001 for this. It was the very first game we made, the very first money we ever made selling a game. Uh, it was a flash game, and it was really well received. And we took those $10,001 to turn this really weird prototype that JW made. Uh, it was called, like, um, Crates from hell, I think. Uh, he's really bad at naming things. Um, and we turned it into this, which was Super Crate Box, and that was our first major success. Uh, it was a freeware game. We didn't earn any money with this. Uh, but it was nominated for the Independent Games Festival Award. So suddenly we were flying to like San Francisco to have fancy meals, uh, which is awesome if you've been eating noodles for like <laughs> six months. But they don't tell you that fancy meals usually mean small meals as well. You know, like if you want cheap food, you get very little food. So we were still hungry by the end of it. Um, but it was nice. It's different than the taste of duck. Um, anyway, so uh, we made this game and suddenly people were paying attention to us. They were suddenly asking us questions and like our opinion and stuff. So we made a game about hip hop on Venus. I don't know. Um, and then people started asking us to like give talks. Okay. Um, that's cool. Um, and then uh, there was this company from uh, from Texas, actually, this company from uh, Austin, Texas, and they were called Devolver, Devolver Digital. And uh, they came to us and they said, hi, we're an independent publisher, which that already sounded like bullshit to me, right? Like, independent publisher, like, what? that doesn't work, right? Um, so they came to us and they said, okay, we own an IP called Sirius Sam, and we want you to make a game in Sirius Sam. And we were like, okay, you know what? These guys are obviously suits, right? They're just business guys. They don't want an original game, they don't want a cool game, but they want a super great box, our biggest success up to them, with a serious soundscape. But 14-year-old me, when I was a kid back in the days, really liked Serious Sam, and 12-year-old JW also really liked Serious Sam. So we didn't want to say no, because we would have set our younger selves. But we also didn't want to say yes, because they were stuck working for a bunch of suits. So we came up with a very smart plan. And the plan was, we are going to pitch the worst idea ever to this company. And then they will say no. And we'll be fine. So Serious Sam is this really fast-paced first-person shooter, right? Like running, shooting, explosions, screaming enemies, all that. So we said, okay, you know what? We'll make a turn-based RPG. <laughs> so we emailed them. And they said yes. 
<laughs> so now we have to make a turn-based RPG about Sirius Sam. It's called Sirius Sam the Random Encounter. Go check it out. It's weird. Uh, I'm pretty proud that we somehow managed to make that game anyway. Anyway. Um, so, things were going really well, we had a game that established that people were listening to us here at Super Great Box was doing well, we were starting to have booths with our own t-shirts, if you own a game company, if you're an independent studio, please make t-shirts. You know how cool it is to wear your own t-shirts, like, I'm wearing my own t-shirt, this is awesome. Um, I have like 12 of these, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, anyway, after that we started working on our next game, and that was called Ridiculous Fishing, that shooting game about fishing with machine guns, remember that? We decided to do an iOS version of that, and uh, it got cloned while we were working on it, which was really sad, so we went to the New York Times and we talked to them about it and they ran this big article. And then even more people were paying attention to us because we've been in the New York Times and somehow that means you're important now. So, okay. Um, anyway, we kept working on the game, we started working on lift routers, and then Ridiculous Fishing came out and it was iOS Game of the Year. <coughs> which... I still don't understand why they call it retro style graphics. Because those are pretty slick vectors, but you know. <laughs> Slide. Uh, anyway, so we, we did that, and then even more people were paying attention, so we started working on a new game. And it was called Nuclear Throne, and it released back in December. Uh, we worked on it for two and a half years. We live streamed our development every Tuesday, every Thursday. You could just watch us make a video game. It was. People apparently like watching people smash their head on keyboards, so that was fun. Uh, anyway, creative business. That's Paradox, right? Like, most people would, assume, like, would agree that's Paradox. It's like... That's kind of how it works. Creativity is, is, is this, this uh, ability to create something out of nothing. It's like when people think about it, they think about it. words like expression, and personal, and art, and culture, and then you've got business. <laughs> which is money, and growth, and profit, and economy, and... They sound a bit like opposites, but they don't have to be, and I would argue, in fact, that if you are an independent studio, or if you are a studio that wants to be an independent studio, or if you're a person that wants to be an independent studio, um, you, you got to learn to look at where they connect rather than where they are opposite, right? Because it's really easy to look at it and go, like, these are opposites. Like, these hate each other. Business and creative, they hate each other. How do we fix this? But instead, look at what can you learn from where they intersect, right? Where are the lessons there? And I think they can learn a lot from each other. So creativity is, and this is straight from Wikipedia, like just copy-pasted it, no shame. Uh, creativity is a phenomenon whereby something new gets and somehow valuable is formed. And then you've got business, which was a way more boring, like this is a paraphrase, this is not a quote, I changed some things in it. Uh, business is an association of persons for carrying a commercial or industrial enterprise with a common purpose and goal, for example, making a profit. So, when you think about uh, creativity, one of the things that you want to be thinking about is your vision, right? So, who is the creative part of their studio? There are no creative people in this audience. There are 20 creative, okay, there's quite a few creative people, cool. I, I'm not that scary, I hope. Too bad, I am, apparently. Okay. Uh, anyway, if you are working on a video game, one of the things you really want to be able to do is explain to anybody in one sentence what the essence of your game is. And very often when I say that, people think that I'm talking about a pitch. I'm not talking about a pitch, but I'm talking about as an essence statement. So, for example, Ridiculous Fishing. Ridiculous Fishing is a game about fishing with machine guns. I just told you that, right? That's our pitch. That's if I try to sell the game to somebody else, that's what I say. It's a game about fishing with machine guns. Everybody laughs, ha ha, good joke, and then they look at the game. Uh, it's great. It works every time. Now, internally, that was not what we were talking about. When we were talking about the game, we were talking about how can we make a game with an infinite positive feedback loop? A game that every time you play, the only way you can go is forward. There's no way to lose money in Ridiculous Fishing. There's no way to be worse off after you play. In fact, we made the game so simple to get into that if the first time you play, if instead of playing the game, you smash your face into the iPad repeatedly, you will still earn enough money to buy an upgrade. <laughs> that's Ridiculous Fishing. And inside our studio, that's how we talk about Ridiculous Fishing. Now, if you're making a game and you don't have that one sentence, what is this game? For us, not for the outside world, for us internally, in the team, you need that statement. You need that essence statement. 
Because if you don't have that, everybody's working on a different game. You know what happens when everybody works on a different game? It's not a game. It's a fucking mess. <laughs> so don't do that. Um, when you think about a game, think of it this way. This is your essence statement. It's at the center, right? It's at the core of your game. And then around that is your mechanics. And your mechanics all have to point back at the core. And then around that is your declarative layer. And your declarative layer are your graphics, your audio, feedback, uh, the way people see what's happening in the mechanics. And around that, you've got backing menus, UI, stuff like that. That core, if you get that wrong, all those arrows back to the middle are going to be pointing in different directions. And people don't know what that means, but they know the game isn't good. That's how you make a bad game. Okay, shit. Go to the left or right? Left. Yes. Uh, now, for business, very different, right? Instead of uh, just having a vision, a creative vision, a dream, anything like that. You need something measurable. You need something that you can communicate, and that on top of communicating it, you can measure as well. So for Flamber, for example, one of our brand goals was to be connected with the world, with the word indie. We want people to think about Flamber when they think about indie. So one of the ways we can test whether this works is a very simple one. Does anybody, um, I think I mentioned it at the start of the talk, does anybody know when Super Crate Box was made? So it's 2010. If you ask this on the internet, most people will say 2008, which is really weird, because it wasn't. But for most people, their idea, their understanding of indie starts in 2008, when Steam kind of started, digital distribution. So when people think about Super Crate Box, they think 2008, which means that it worked. People think of Blackberry as indie. That was a measurable goal. That was something that we wanted. We wanted people to not know when we started. We wanted them to think of us as always being indie. Now, when you set goals for yourself, try to think in two ways. A lot of people set, um, set different types of goals, but the two goals you want to set are small goals and really big goals. The small goals because you can reach them quickly. The big goals because you can work on them for years. Now, the middle goals, screw middle goals. Middle goals are ridiculous. Anybody who sets middle goals needs to stop doing it. Middle goals are the goals that take too long to quickly do something about and are too short to actually have a meaningful impact. Don't do that. The games industry moves fast. Like in three weeks, everything is going to be different. Like four, think about it. Two months ago, nobody had heard of Pokemon Go. What happened? Well, the industry changed. It happens all the time. Don't do middle goals. So if you want to do a creative business, the thing between those two is communication. If you, want to, if you want to have a clear vision, if you want to have something that you can measure, you need to be able to communicate well. And communication is really hard. Like, I'm talking to you in words. You know what words are? Really ridiculous. When you think about it, I'm trying to communicate a concept from my head into your head using language. The problem with language is that everybody understands words differently. I do this exercise with students all the time, where I say a word, and then I ask people in the audience to give me a word back. Like, the first word to think of. So if I say the word sun, big ball of lava in the sky. Like, what, what do you think of? Just give a word. Like, Praise the sun. What? Praise the sun? Ha. Uh, you? Charmander. Yellow Charmander. You play too much Pokemon Go. <laughs> Moon. Moon. I can do this for everybody, and like three people would have the same word. Everybody else would say something else. That's just the word sun. We all agree what the sun is. Apparently, we don't agree what it means. Now, try communicating about a game that doesn't exist yet. Yeah, good luck with words. Um, Communicating something abstract is really, really hard, and um, for as a business, communicating value is really, really hard. Uh, and the way you communicate between those two is a pitch. That's your pitch. It is communicating your creative vision as a value. So who here, who here is working on a game? Who here wants to pitch their game? Wow. You all got really bad pitches if nobody wants to pitch their game. No? Yeah. Yeah, you can pitch your game. I mean, you have a full audience of people listening. <laughs> Anybody? I see one person who really wants to pitch, so... Yeah, go. Um, does it make a VR version of the classic Pokemon Go... Ah, uh, Pokemon Snap game. Sorry. I'm making a VR version, sorry, of the classic uh, Pokemon Snap game, where you have uh, creatures popping up and you have to take a photo of them in the best way possible, angle and pose and all that kind of stuff. It's a Nintendo 64 game that I'm kind of reskinning, obviously not using the Pokemon IP, but uh, yeah. 
Uh, basically. <laughs> so uh, um, just uh, thank you so much, by the way. It's super brave that you, super brave just that you do that in front of everybody. <laughs> Is it okay if I give you some feedback? Sure. Is it okay if everybody else gives you some feedback? Who thought that was a good pitch? <laughs> just raise your hand. Seriously, if you thought it was a good pitch, raise your hand. Right. So imagine I know nothing about video games. I just think you pitched a VR Nintendo 64 game to me about Pokemon without Pokemon. Yeah. <laughs> then, um, imagine I'm interested in this game, okay? Imagine I really want this. Somehow I really want Nintendo 64 VR. I'm gonna go home and I have this big bag of money sitting here, right? And I wanna give it to you. What is the name of your game? I can't Google that. Right. I would really want to email you this bag of money, but... I tried Googling Nintendo 64 VR and I couldn't find it. It was really weird. When you do a pitch, you want to make it short, you want to make it snappy, and the most important thing is you want to communicate value. What is the value of my game? What is interesting about it? Why did I make it? Why should I, why should I give a shit? What is interesting about it? Right? If you can do that in one to three sentences, you're golden. If it takes more than three sentences, most people get bored. It's the way it is. So, okay. Sorry, can I just say something with I think I communicated the internal... Yep, uh, that was an essence statement. You, yeah, not, yeah, not actually the pitch. Yeah. <laughs> if you do an essence statement, please avoid terms like and something like that. That's not a very clear phrase, okay? Uh, when you communicate, think of words as mathematics. Like, the less words you use, the, the stronger your statement is going to be. The less noise you add, the better it is. Use fewer words. Less words is better. Okay, I'm gonna have to hurry up. I'm talking too much. Okay, so um, iteration. Everybody knows about iteration, right? Uh, if I say uh, if I say Jesse Shell's model of iteration, you all know what that is? Okay, so the basic idea is there's this thing called a loop, right? And the loop is your creative process. It's an idea, and they implement the idea, and they test the idea, and they throw it away or you keep it. You all know that loop, right? That's one iteration. Now, Jesse Shell is a game designer, and he basically claims that the more often you go through that loop, the better your game is. It's that simple. It's not how big your loop is, not how much time you take per loop. It is the more frequent you go through it, the better your game is. So what he's arguing is test very small things. And test them very rapidly, test them very fast. If you're making a game, start prototyping day one, start testing day two, right? Now, in creative work, the way you learn is through failing. It's through taking a risk, seeing if it works, and then if it works, keep it. If it doesn't, throw it out. And in most cases, if you're a creative, 99% of what you do is going to suck. It's the way it is. I, at Flamber, we have a folder with 120 games, and they're all horrible. One of them is called Super Astronaut Ninja. It is a square on a screen, and then we realized that we were making a game because the title sounded cool instead of the game was cool. So we're like, yeah, never mind. Uh, so we feel fast. We were like, oh, don't make that. Um, now, in business, you want to do kind of the opposite. You don't want to iterate too much. You want to find something that you can repeat. You succeed, and then you figure out why did that succeed, and then you do that again. That's the safest way to do business. Do it again, do it better. Do it bigger. Improve. No research and development. If you can, the less research and development, the less risk there is. Um, and that's kind of weird. Uh, but it is the way you do good business. The thing is, what you want to find is not necessarily something you can repeat over and over. You want to figure out why people attach to the previous thing. So for Vlambeer, what we realized really quickly is people like our style of humor. People like our style of irre like irreverent games. Uh, but they also like how tight our game design is. So that's what we do. The fun thing is, because we just make games that we want to make, that's who we are. So we don't have to fake to be a business. We're just us, and our fans like us. <laughs> nice. Now, as a creative business, uh, what is very important is understanding your responsibility. So, who, who here works in more than is more than one person in a studio? Okay. Who's the producer? Who here works in a studio without a producer? Who here can tell me what the job of a producer is? <laughs> Nobody knows what a producer is. It's really weird. Uh, no, the thing is, a producer is the person who keeps your game on, on budget, on schedule, you know, they make sure the game works. Uh, it, like, the game releases and goes at some point. 
Uh, the funny thing is, everybody has a different definition of producer. The important thing is, whatever it is in your studio, you all need to agree on it, and you all need to be okay with that. So, at Vlambeer, there's two people. I, uh, JW does the design. He's responsible for the game design. I'm responsible for everything else. Right? Now, here's the way it works. JW will come up with a design. Once, uh, Luftkrausers. We were making a game for Luftkrausers. It was an airplane game, and I wanted clouds in the background so we could see how fast the airplanes move. So we put clouds in the background, and JW wanted these really cool Chinese water painting clouds. They look like this, you know? And I wanted clouds that look like fucking clouds, because they're clouds, so... Put clouds there already, right? We fought over this for three days. Three days. On day one, we fought. On day two, we got to the office, we saw each other, we both went back home, because we really didn't want to deal with this one more day. Then on the third day, I told JW, the Chinese water painting clouds, they look like wind. So it looks like it should move the airplane. And they went, okay, clouds. So we have clouds. Now the funny thing is, if that turned out to be a bad decision, you know whose fault that is? His. He's the designer. If I had a bad idea, he should have told me and stop it. That's his job. That's literally his responsibility. Now for the business, if I listen to JW, and JW's business ideas are usually something along the lines of, let's give away the game for free, um, if I listen to that, and that turns out to be a bad idea, then it's my fault, because I'm in charge of business. In fact, if I, if I argue with JW, and he thinks what I'm arguing is bad, he can veto me. He can just go, Rami, no, end of conversation. We don't talk about it again. I, I trust him as a designer, he trusts me as whatever my job is, everything else. Um, the point is, that clear hi hierarchy allows us to make good choices. And that doesn't just go for creative, that goes for business as well. Because we clearly know who says what, who has final say in everything. We never get in a stalemate where four people are arguing for like three weeks about nothing. And you want to know the most common reason I get called to an indie studio to help them out with something? You know what that is? They just released the game, they're starting on the new game, they can't reach an agreement about the new game. And studios die over that. Studios disappear over that, where they're just stuck. And these four friends that started this game studio just can't agree on what's next. And then they split up and the studio's gone. Don't allow that. Have somebody in charge. Have somebody who can pick the project. How much time do I have? Three minutes. Three minutes? Nice. That's not enough. Um, so, okay. Creativity is supposed to be genuine, right? Genuine, it's personal. Everything is a remix. Everybody knows everything is a remix, as I say. I'm going to talk really fast. Is that okay? Okay, so everything is a remix. The idea behind everything is a remix is that everything you see, everything you do, everything you experience is part of your creative, like, whatever it is in your brain. And from that, you pull stuff, right? So the best way you can make a game is to just go. Go, start going somewhere. It doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter. Just pick a direction and go, and then your, your creative whatever will tell you this is wrong or this is right. Um, you are, by definition, the best version of you. Don't be afraid to make wrong choices. You know what wrong choices are? They're bullshit. They don't exist. There's nobody in the world that looks at two choices, A and B, and B is definitely worse. And they go, yeah, B. <laughs> nobody does that. That's not the way decision making works. We look at our choices and then we go, we've got A and B, A looks better, we pick A. It might turn out in hindsight not to work out, but you didn't know that back at the time. All you can do is be informed. So try to inform yourself. Now in business, you can't really work with that because that's not measurable, so you want to focus. You want to focus test, you want to deal with your brand expectations. Expectations are hard. If you make one game, people expect your next game to be like the game, but not too much like the game, but not too far away from the game. <laughs> the internet is weird, consumers are weird. Um, just make stuff, honestly. Um, but test it. If you're, if you're going to be a business, you want to test it. Test it with people from your audience, test it with your community, understand who your audience is and who you're reaching out to. When we made Super Crate Box, it was a pixel game for PC because it was a hardcore pixel game. When we did Ridiculous Fishing, we wanted something softer because people on iOS didn't like pixels, so we didn't do pixels. Either way, what I'm trying to say is there's constraints and constraints are good. Everybody thinks of constraints as bad, constraints are awesome. You know what the scariest thing in the world is? Absolute freedom. If I told you, Here's a hundred million dollars, go make a game. If you had an answer to me about what game that would be, that's bullshit. Nobody knows what they're gonna do with a hundred. Is anybody here in, like, does anybody here own a hundred million? 
<laughs> Unity guys here still, right? No, you don't? Know, too bad. Um, anyway, constraints are good. If you don't know where to go, draw a line. Just any line, and see what that does for you. Uh, for creative, it allows you to be more genuine, and it allows you to see whether you like the line, and in the case of business, blocking off things will help you make better choices. So, it's not a contradiction, but creative business is sort of a well machine so, machine, so there's two skills that I want you to take away um, if you want to run a creative business and invent a studio. The first thing is awareness. So be aware of the industry, be aware of trends. Who here read the games news today? Please tell me you read the games. You're in the games industry. Good. Uh, where did Adam Boyce, Adam Boyce, former CEO of, uh, not CEO, former TPR of PlayStation, he just announced his new job. Where did he go? No, he is from Canada. He went to Iron Galaxy. Who here read the news about what the Nintendo NX is? What is the Nintendo NX according to rumors? <laughs> this is Nintendo. Come on, this is one of the biggest. These, these people will have Pokemon Go released. Like, what did what did uh, what did Tim Sweeney say about Microsoft? The yes, Microsoft is trying to ruin Steam, says Tim Sweeney. <laughs> uh, what is the what is the uh, what is the news about uh, iOS revenue? What is the what is the biggest revenue maker in the world in terms of country? It was America until very recently. What is the new one? China. China. Who's on third? I don't know. <laughs> it's Japan. Okay, this was all in the news today. If you went to gamesindustry.biz and read the top 10 headlines, you would know the answers to all of these because that's where I literally just found them. You need to read the news. This is your industry. Come on, be, be aware of what's happening. Twitch is awesome. VR, AR, all that stuff. And don't just blindly walk after stuff because you know what happens if you just blindly walk after stuff? People in mobile, you know what they've been saying for years? Mobile is too saturated. We're going to make PC games. You know what people on PC are saying? Saying, PC discoverability is hard, we're going to make console games. You know what people on console are saying? Console is too difficult to make games for, we're going to make mobile games. Everybody's walking in circles. Don't just walk in circles. Figure out a thing, do that thing, do it right. Figure out a spot in the industry, read the news, figure out where the trends are, go from there. He's standing up, that's scary. Um, <laughs> now the biggest thing, the biggest thing I want you to take away is that everything you do in this industry is a choice. It's a selection. There are options, and you're going to pick one. And you're going to pick that one with confidence, but you need to learn to pick for the right reason. So what is the most important question you can ask yourself? Will I be happy? What? Will I be happy? Will I be happy? That's a good question, by the way. What am I good at? What am I good at? No? It's a good question, though. Where is the money? Why? What? Why are you here? Why are you in this room? Why are you listening to me in a weird shirt talking about video games? Like Ooh, nice. Like Why are you making games? Why are you making this game? Why would anybody care about this game? Why am I making it in this engine? Not that engine. Why not Unity? <laughs> why Unity? Why whatever? Why? Ask why. Everything you do, ask why. You know why? why? Important question. Because it's not the right answer. No, that doesn't. <laughs> because why stops you from making a choice? Because you assume it's true. Why stops you from just going with the flow? You look at what you're doing, you ask yourself why. If you ask yourself every day, you know what you get? A good game studio. Does that mean it will work out? I don't know. Does that mean you will be successful? I don't know. Do I have the answers? Of course not. But can I tell you one thing? Yes, if you ask yourself why, if you make your choices, if you select carefully, you have a shot at making independent games. Questions? Why? Why? <laughs> For me? Just one question. We go do one question. If I talk really fast, can I do two? <laughs> Give it a shot. Okay, let's anyone, go. Anyone over there? Just go ahead. Um, how would you advise someone who has published a game and it was somewhat successful to identify what were the components to make it successful? So you're asking if you made a successful game, how do you identify what the success was? Well, I mean, the thing, the thing, the one thing you can see is what people are saying about the game, right? You have access to the feedback, you've access potentially to the stats about the game, uh, but what you want to look at is the, the state of the industry, what you were doing, 
and then figure out what the core values were of that game that people attached to. So do you know your asset statements? Do you have that one sentence thing about that game, about your successful game? No? You want to figure that out. What was it that made that game tick? And then there could be an infinite number of variables, right? The right time, the right place, the right platform, the uh, right theme. If you made something with Pokemon, it's going to be real big right now. Uh, if you made something with location-based gaming, could be real big right now. Does that mean it will work again next week? Probably not. Uh, but the thing is, don't overthink that. Start, fi like, figure out a voice. What is your voice? What was the voice you had in that game? And then go from there. Hey, uh, how do you find good teammates? I mean, you got lucky. How do you find good teammates if you're not lucky? You're not lucky. No. That's no. an interesting word. It works. Uh, yeah, it works. Uh, so, the best way, honestly, that I found to find teammates, so everybody outside of JW that we work with, we find through game jams. Always game jams. Because game jams are like high stress environments where people have to rapidly deliver good work. And if people can operate well within a game jam, within like 48 hours of making games, then we want to talk to them. And then if we talk to them, honestly, what we do is we sit them down and we talk to them for like three hours. And if they have like the same vibe as we have, if they have the same um, vision that we have for the game, then we hire them. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the We don't have time for any more questions, but you can feel free to find out after. Thank you. Thank you very much.